In this lecture, I'm continuing my discussion of the emergence of the intelligentsia uh, in Russia, such an important group that had so much an influence in later years uh, on how Russians thought about their country and its fate. This time, I continue this by focusing on the Westernizers, so-called Westernizers, which was, by the way, the larger of the two main movements of Westernizers and Slavophiles, who I talked about last time. In many ways, the Westernizers are actually more difficult to talk about. The Slavophiles formed a relatively coherent intellectual trend, partly because there weren't as many of them. The Westernizers, by contrast, were much more diffuse and more varied. What really united them uh, and provoked their attacks uh, on the Slavophiles was their belief, shared by the way with Chadayev increasingly, that Russia's only hope, that its only future, lay in fully joining the developed civilization uh, of the West. But they had many different approaches to thinking about how to do that and what the West meant to them. Rather than try to generalize about their ideas or to describe them all and all the variety individually, I want to focus on a single individual primarily, a truly remarkable man who exemplified in so many ways the emerging intelligentsia as a whole uh, and especially uh, the westernizers in his sensibilities and his ideas uh, and above all in how influential he would become in later years as in some ways the most characteristic westernizer. And this was a man named Vissarion Bolinsky who lived from 1811 to 1848. He died quite young. Socially, Belinsky's interesting because he's unlike most of the other radicals of the 1830s and 1840s, most of the other intelligenti. He's not the wealthy son of a gentry, but the son of a modest country doctor, uh, a sign of how much society is changing that young men like this could also receive uh, enough education to join this intelligentsia. Later, in fact, many young intelligenti would come from this so-called group of what they called in Russian, Raznochinsi, uh, literally people from various ranks, not, in other words, from the traditional estates of peasants and nobles uh, and clergy, but really emerging in many ways from this growing middle class uh, in Russia. And this origin, to some degree, may have mattered. It made Belinsky and others like him, in a certain sense, sociologically alien from his society, uh, having no place in its traditional order, and therefore perhaps more likely to imagine a society in which they did have a place, where the middle class had a place. Now these sort of determinations, social determinations, are I think important in the history of the intelligentsia, but perhaps even more important were personal, uh, psychological uh, influences. And this was very important in Belinsky's case. In fact, in many ways, as I think you'll see, it was his disposition, it was his style, that made him so interesting, so compelling to so many, and I think to us as well. Now the fact that he was underprivileged uh, had, among other effects, an important one in that he was in some ways less prepared intellectually than other members of the intelligentsia. His intellectual skills were less finely developed. Unlike most others who came from the nobility, who had excellent tutors at home, and then went off to university, he didn't have this, and one of the results was that he didn't know foreign languages. In particular, he couldn't read German except in a halting sort of way. He had to have translations, which his fellow intelligenti were ha happy uh, to provide. His higher education was also weaker than the others, though he was able to get into Moscow University. He was expelled after three years for being uh, a bit of a troublesome student for his political uh, activism. But Belinsky characteristically made up for this lack of very sophisticated intellectual training, such as his other fellow intelligenti had, with emotional commitment and fervor. And in many ways, this became the essence of his intellectual style. He says, for me, to think, to feel, to understand, and to suffer are one and the same thing. In many ways, though the particular reasons for this in Belinsky's case are partly social, one sees this in the life of almost all the westernizer uh, intelligentsia, um, all the westernizer intelligenti. Uh, notably, one sees this in his friend and this well-known uh, intelligent who we've talked about briefly before, Alexander Herzen. Uh, we've already seen uh, last time, Herzen's emotional reaction to the church ceremony in 1826, marking the execution of the Decembrists. 
Another moment occurred slightly later and was again characteristic. Young Herzen and a very close friend of his were walking along the Sparrow Hills on the northern outskirts of Moscow. And the cupolas glittered over the city of many churches and a fresh breeze, he tells us, uh, shake, shook the leaves. And suddenly, with tears in their eyes, these two young men embraced and swore to sacrifice their lives to the struggle against injustice uh, and evil. Here too, thinking and feeling and suffering were all of a piece, characteristic of Intelligenti, uh, in particular of Belinsky. This is also, of course, very true to the whole romantic ideal, to the ideal that true understanding comes from not mere thinking, not mere reason, but from deep intuitive insight, from feeling uh, even uh, suffering, something the Slavophiles understood as well. And this combination of thinking and feeling pervaded Belinsky's life. Like other intelligenti, Belinsky was serious about everything. He was absolutely determined to refuse to separate private, ordinary trifles of life from the idea of ideas, from the world and life of ideas. What, which meant, among other things, that if you happened to be visiting with Belinsky or invited him over for something to eat, when many people did, knowing that his uh, personal uh, life was much more uh, modest and he couldn't afford to uh, indulge people the way others could indulge him, it turns out that as a result he was sometimes a rather poor guest. A story is told to illustrate this, also told by Alexander Herzen, uh, whose memoir, called, by the way, Past and Thoughts, is the source of so much of what we know about the lives of the intelligentsia. One day, it was said, Belinsky was invited to dine with some friends during a Holy Week, during Easter week, and he noticed that Lenten dishes were being served. And he says to his, the host, he says, since when have you become so devout? Remember, most of these, or these intelligenti were rather critical of uh, traditional religion. And the answer was, oh, don't worry, Vassarian, it's not for us, but you know what would our servants think if we didn't eat Lenten uh, dishes? Belinsky was outraged, stood up, knocked his chair back. Uh, this is a man who hates hypocrisy. And he declares, the servants, where are your servants? I'm going right now to tell them that they've been tricked. And you imagine yourselves to be free-minded. You're in the same boat with the czars and the priests and the slave owners. Goodbye. I eat no Lenten fare for instructive purposes. And he walks out. He was never light-hearted, although one should say he did occasionally get extremely drunk. Uh, these were not ascetic individuals, but nonetheless serious uh, nonetheless. And at all times, even when drunk, he was unrelenting in his search for truth. Another story uh, to illustrate this, this time uh, told by the famous writer uh, Ivan Turgenev. Belinsky at this point was struggling, as many of his fellows were, with God, the question of God's existence. And Turgenev uh, happened to be uh, meeting with Belinsky at the time, and they were talking about it, and in general enjoying this interesting argument about whether God existed. And Belinsky refused to talk about anything else. I mean, for days and days and days, it was his only subject, and people said he was practically in a fever over this uh, question. And Turgenev joined in. And here are Turgenev's recollections. I was frankly affected by his sincerity and enthusiasm and carried away by the importance of the subject. But after spending two or three hours in conversation, I began to tire. The, light the lightheartedness of youth took the upper hand. I thought of a walk or dinner. But Belinsky would not stop. There was no lightheartedness of youth with him. And he responded to Turgenev bitterly and in earnest, according to the recollection, he said, we have not solved the existence of God, and you want to eat. It's important to pay attention to this style, this uh, manner, however bizarre it might seem uh, to us, however exaggerated and dramatic it might seem. And it's important to pay attention to it, not only to understand Belinsky personally, but to understand a key aspect of the culture of this whole intelligentsia that would last for generations beyond. And another story illustrates this and how widespread it, it was and its characteristic. Uh, in this case, uh, Herzen uh, tells how he's visiting a friend of his, uh, Vadim Pasek, not a very significant man, a Polish man interested in Polish liberation. 
they were enjoying a glass of Rhine wine when, uh, Herzen recalls, Vadim became more and more gloomy. And suddenly, with tears in his eyes, he repeated the words of Don Carlos, which is from a play by Schiller, who was quoting them from Julius Caesar, 23 years old, and still I've done nothing for eternity. And with emphasis, he smashes his hand down on the wine glass, breaking it, cutting himself, and bleeding on the table. This is rather typical of living out, in some ways, a dramatic life from books, from ideas, uh, from the whole spirit of, the romantic, of romanticism. But the point here was serious. The goal of all of these young intelligenti was to serve some higher goal in life, contribute to eternity, as he said. And Belinsky shared in this sort of passion, this search for purpose. Now, all of this passion was dedicated to ideas. So what were these ideas for Belinsky? According to Belinsky himself, in a letter he wrote just before his death, his ideas passed through three main stages. His words, God was my first thought, humanity my second, and man, the individual that is, my third and final. One need only add that each stage was logically, or perhaps better to say intuitively, connected to the next. Let's follow this path with him. I already mentioned uh, Belinsky's struggle with theodicy, with this eternal question of the existence of evil in a world supposedly created by God, who by definition is good, this problem of theodicy. Belinsky's solution, uh, an argument, by the way, increasingly common to many 19th century uh, Russian and European thinkers, was, well, obviously, there can be no God, since evil is so palpable. And indeed, this sort of atheism was becoming increasingly widespread in the Russian uh, intelligentsia. His second major intellectual struggle was connected to this first problem, uh, but with a less easy solution. How do you explain evil at all? How do you explain human evil in the world? Now, you remember that like other educated Russians of the 1830s, Belinsky was enamored with German idealistic philosophy especially Schelling and Hegel. He had to read it in translation, but nonetheless, that didn't stop the intensity of his embrace of these ideas. And as we've seen, these works, especially Schelling, taught that everything that exists in the world is a manifestation of the absolute, uh, of the spirit that connects everything. In other words, that everything that exists in the world, every individual thing, is an embodiment of the totality of all things. It's part of a higher harmony. If so, sort of like the problem with if God exists, how, if everything is connected and part of a totality, can so much obvious evil exist in the world? So much that was so contrary to one's liberal, enlightened ideals. And Belinsky concluded, because he had to find an answer to this question, and many others around him made the same came to the same conclusion, he concluded that the only correct philosophical response to all of this evil was to say, all is as it should be. And reading Hegel seemed to really convince him of this. Uh, Hegel at one point wrote in one of his famous works that all that is real is rational. And now whether Hegel himself actually meant to try to provide in this phrase philosophical justification to everything that exists, to the status quo in the world is controversial. Uh, in fact, I should mention that Hegel also identified struggle against evil, conflict as at the very essence of reality. But whatever Hegel's actual view, what really mattered is how Belinsky and others around him uh, read this phrase, all that is real is rational. This was in 1839, 1840 when these discussions were going on, and Belinsky, like many others in his circle, read this in a conservative way. Here he seemed to find a solution to this terrible clash between ideals and reality. The answer, reconcile yourself with reality. Reconcile yourself even to evil. And he actually described this enlightenment, if that's what it is, in a letter. He says, quote, I now look upon reality, which I used to hold in such contempt, and I tremble with mystic joy, recognizing its rationality, realizing that nothing in it may be rejected, nothing could be condemned or spurned. Now, he didn't deny that evil existed in the world. On the contrary, he continued to speak of it, 
mainly in letters and in uh, conversations, and he even spoke of the evil of the world as, as disgusting and vile and ugly and dead and oppressive. But now, he said, I can accept this world. Or at least he tried to convince himself philosophically that he should. This lasted about a year. And about that point, Belinsky found this whole argument to be totally unbearable. Now, it's revealing that Belinsky managed to escape from this reconciliation with reality, as it was often called uh, at the time, not by better logic, not by reading Hegel more carefully and understanding him more deeply, not by reinterpreting Hegel the way, for example, the young Karl Marx would do in Germany uh, at the time in a whole group of young Hegelians who read a radical implication in all of Hegel. No, Belinsky's solution was by trusting his deeper instincts. In other words, by turning to his moral feeling rather than pure philosophical rationalism. And I should say this was more than just a matter of feeling, though that's very central uh, for Belinsky. It was also meant, it was also connected to a rediscovery and a reemphasis on a central philosophical, really ethical uh, idea, one that was becoming central to the whole emerging thought of the intelligentsia, at least the westernizer intelligentsia. And this was not God, not the absolute, not humanity in the abstract, but that final point that Belinsky said was central to the evolution of his thought, namely the individual human being, man. In fact, we here encounter another key cultural word, uh, a Russian word worth uh, knowing. You'll hear it again later. Uh, and this is the word leechnist. Leechnist. This is the individual person. It means also, though, the human personality. It means the self in a certain way. It's what makes people human, what's inside every person that makes them human, and what gives them dignity as a human being and natural rights. In a lot of ways, you saw this idea of the human personality giving people dignity and rights, this idea of leechness in the writing of early and the thinking of early intellectuals. Novikov, for example, especially his essay on human dignity. The Decembrists, uh, and many others, even young Alexander I. It was so much a part of his education, so much a part of the Enlightenment. But now, in the 1830s and 40s, this was much more, much more passionate, much more intense. And with this idea in mind, uh, this idea of the personality and the rights and dignity that go with it, this idea of leechness, Belinsky was able to face the world around him truly armed to do battle. With it in hand, he took on almost all the conventional philosophical thinking among educated Russians. And now is when Belinsky is really coming into his own, really making a mark as a thinker and really explaining why his influence is so great. He now totally rejects the dry, abstract philosophizing of the German idealists and all their Russian followers, which he was an extreme example of only uh, moments before. And in the course of the 1840s, he rails against all this dry philosophizing. What is it to me, he says, that the universal exists when the individual personality, leechness is the word he uses here, is suffering? The universal, he says, isolated from the particular and the individual, is nothing but a lifeless, self-indulgent dream. The fate of the individual, he says at another place, the fate of the person is more important to me than the fate of the whole world. This is really classic Belinsky, as he'd later be remembered and would as later be so influential. Perhaps he's not so philosophically consistent anymore, perhaps not so philosophically rigorous, but he is morally, ethically consistent. In fact, it's this moral consistency, this moral passion that makes Belinsky so influential in his time, and indeed for the rest of the 19th and well into the 20th century. He made him so much the model intelligent. Now, it's also upon this principle of the individual person that Belinsky was able to construct a dramatic and extensive critique of the world around him, of the Russian world around him especially, a critique that became very uh, influential, widely read uh, decades after he died. He criticized, as so many had before him, autocracy and serfdom, uh, as in his words, trampling upon everything that is even remotely human and noble. 
He also condemned poverty in Russian as a violation of the dignity of man, prostitution for the same reason, drunkenness uh, as something he occasionally indulged in himself, he began to realize was an indignity to human honor, to human morality, to the potentiality of the human being. Bureaucratic coldness, he criticized. Cruelty of the powerful toward the weak. And he also criticized uh, very personal matters, including the widespread Russian custom of wife beating, something he noted still existed even among educated and Europe Europeanized Russians. This filled him with disgust. The most famous example, influential example, of this social, really moral criticism of the existing world can be found in a letter widely copied, passed hand to hand in Russia. Most of this, of course, could not be printed. That was sent in 1847 uh, to the famous, already famous, writer Nikolai Gogol. Now, as a writer of fiction, Gogol had become widely celebrated for his brilliant exposés of corruption, uh, widespread in Russian politics, but especially in Russian social life, uh, in a system in which people could own other people. And he made clear his sympathies with the poor and the downtrodden. Most famously, for example, one sees this in his great novel, Dead Souls, which is really a brilliant and funny novel about the absurdities of a system uh, where people control, uh, the, own the very bodies or the souls of other people. Hence, imagine the shock. In 1847, when Gogol publishes a book called Selected Passages from Correspondence with Friends, in which he bluntly and without any of his usual irony or satirical style declared that the way to the much needed regeneration of the Russian nation was not social change, not political change, but personal inward transformation and submission to the church, to the czar, and to all existing forms of social authority. Belinsky, who read this, uh, wrote a response filled with the moral outrage that so many shared. What is it, he said, that Ru what, what does Russia really most need, he said? Not, this is a quote, not sermons, she's heard enough of them, not prayers, she has repeated them often enough, but the awakening in the people of a sense of their human dignity, lost in the mud and the filth for so many centuries. What's missing in Russia, he declared, is rights and laws and respect for what he called human individuality, honor, and property. And as for Gogol's appeals that all of this was somehow connected to Christianity, to Christian truth, to his own awakening, uh, to religion and hence turn away from criticizing the status quo, Belinsky made it clear he had nothing but contempt for this claim to be Christian. He says to Gogol in this letter, widely read by everybody, why have you mixed up Christ in all this? He was the first to bring, people, bring to people the teaching of freedom, equality, uh, and brotherhood. And by the way, this non-theistic admiration of Christ as a great teacher as a radical even, uh, would be increasingly common among the intelligentsia. And again and again, Belinsky made similar arguments uh, in his writings. For Belinsky, in a way, there was only one absolute, only one categorical imperative, the dignity of the human person. And his rigorous and continual emphasis on this is partly what made it such a central idea now among many who could read uh, in Russia. And on this basis of this idea, he argued we needed a new state in Russia, free of autocratic despotism, a new society where individuals are free, and even a new culture where Russians would learn to treat each other with respect. And Belinsky also wrote a great deal about literature. In fact, he worked professionally most of his life as a literary critic for various uh, journals. And his literary arguments are in many ways inseparable from these moral arguments. What Belinsky said was most needed in literature was truth, truth above all. And this meant partly a probing uh, examination, a portrayal of real life. He hated works of fantasy or escape or sheer uh, pure asceticism. What was really needed though most of all was a commitment to true ideas, especially to moral truth. Uh, and above all this meant a concern for the dignity of individual uh, people. Uh, this is why he so admired Gogol's early works and why he was so dismayed at Gogol's correspondence from friends. As he told Gogol himself in the 1847 letter, he said, 
the public is always ready to forgive a writer for a bad book, that is to say, aesthetically bad, but never for a pernicious one, in other words, ideologically and morally bad. And the special condition of Russian life, he said, made literature especially important in the face of terrible political oppression, social oppression, which, as he said, induce dejection, weariness, and apathy. Only literature, as he says, still lives. As he put it, with the title, with us, us Russians, the title of poet and writer has long since eclipsed the tinsel of epaulets and gaudy uniforms. And many other intellectuals, Herzen among them, made similar uh, arguments, repeatedly pointing out that in Russia, the land that Herzen called at one point a land of silence, this is Nicholas I's reign, the power of the word is exceptional, and literature especially conveys that. I want to conclude with a, a final observation here. This idea of leechness, of the individual, the self, uh, what is natural to each human being, what is the source of their uh, dignity, uh, which was so central to everything Belinsky wrote, was in many ways, I think, the most key idea that really divided the Slavophiles from the Westernizers. Not just their attitudes toward the West or Russia. Uh, this was as much symbol as it really was uh, substance. Uh, Belinsky, in fact, uh, a leading Westernizer, of course, could be quite critical of Western Europe, of Western European civilization, especially when, as he put it, it fails to be human. Uh, for example, he noted in the way women were treated in Western Europe was a sign that this culture hadn't truly achieved the full humanness, respect for the individual dignity of all that needs to be found in any truly developed culture. Herzen, too, was a very strong and vigorous critic of European culture. In particular, and he spent a great deal of time in exile in Western Europe, he found quite troubling the West's preoccupation with what he considered to be money uh, and material goods. Western culture seemed to be less concerned than many Russians, at least than elite intellectuals like himself, with the world of truth, with the world of ideas, with the world of spirit, with tr creating a truly uh, happy, uh, prosperous, um, alive society for individuals. Uh, in fact, at one point he said it seemed to him that Western European society was more concerned with respectability than with real human dignity, with the surfaces rather than the deep quality of people's lives. What really distinguished, I think, Westernizers, as this may suggest, from Slavophiles was their attitude toward the individual person. The Slavophiles tended to idealize a world in which people were all bonded together in a natural community, in this community of subordinates, of spiritual unity based on common values uh, and sentiments. The Westernizers idealized the individual and were concerned above all with the, his or her uh, rights and dignity within society. This was a fundamental difference, and it would remain a fundamental difference long after the Westernizers and the Slavophiles as such ceased to exist. This difference between community and unity and the respect for the individual would remain a central debate among all Russians, including at the level of the state, thinking about the future of their country and its relationship to other cultures. For Belinsky, it's worth saying, because there's another aspect of this I want to emphasize, this was, as you can probably see, a fundamentally liberal idea. And indeed, Russian liberalism, which would begin to emerge in the 1860s, grew on this very same basis, the idea of the individual and the, per the person's uh, rights uh, rooted in dignity. But for Belinsky, and for many others increasingly, this idea about the individual was also a socialist idea. Belinsky, along with Herzen and several others, began for the first time to call themselves socialists uh, in 1841. Now, for most 19th century socialists, uh, European socialists like Saint-Simon uh, or Fourier, uh, French so-called utopian socialists, but also for Russians who called themselves socialists in the early 1840s and after, like Herzen and Belinsky, socialism was a social ideal about transforming society that was meant above all to promote the human individual. It was about a more just society in which all people, even the poorest, would have a chance 
to flourish, to realize their dignity. That socialism, in Russia at least, turned out in a different way is another story, one that I'll be getting to. Next time, though, we'll be returning to the story of the state, uh, to the reign in particular of Emperor Alexander II, and at another major uh, attempt at reform. Because remember, it's not just intellectuals who recognized that Russia needed uh, to change. This time, though, talk of reform would have huge consequences. Indeed, finally, mere talk in government circles about changing Russia would be replaced by dramatic action.